Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for coming to today's event. This is an event for the research series Environment in Asia, uh, hosted at uh, the Felbank Center for Chinese Studies, Harvard University. Uh, welcome to the event. Uh, we really appreciate you set out your lunch time to spend that uh, with us. Okay, um, I'm a my name is Lin Zhang, or Zhang Lin in Chinese way. I am a environmental and economic historian at a Boston College here in Boston, neighbor to Harvard University. Um, I am associate in research with, with Felbank Center, and also I'm convening this series Environment in Asia for the center. So this event is the second uh, event for this year's program for this semester. So um, if you are curious about our uh, our events, please go to the Fairbank Center's website to check out the future event. But I do want to remind you um, on our list, a very exciting event to come up soon. So um, let me introduce that, then I'm going to move on to our today's event. So in two weeks, also Friday, November 6, if you're interested, come to join us um, for a discussion with uh, Judith Shapiro and uh, Ife Lee on the topic called authoritarian environmentalism and a Chinese ecological civilization. Judith Shapiro is a professor at American University and Yifei Li is a professor, assistant professor for Chinese studies at uh, New York University in Shanghai. So the event, the time is a little different, it will be dinner time, 7 p.m. for American Eastern time. So given the time change, that will be 8 a.m. in China. That will be 8 a.m. in China for Yifei Li, our, one of our speaker in the morning of a Saturday. So um, yes, so please join us. So that event will co-host it, be co-moderated by me and also a special host. That will be Professor Arunab Ghosh here at Harvard University. Um, Professor Arunab Ghosh is a historian of uh, modern China and he specializes in uh, social, economic and also environmental history for modern China. So uh, Arunab and I will co-host that event on November 6th. For details, please go to the website of Felbank Center. So really exciting today, wonderful. Let me quickly introduce our fabulous speakers for today. So let me first begin with David. David Bemben is a professor, assistant professor for history um, at University of California, Irvine. And David is a historian for Japan and Korea, specializing in environmental history and historical geography of Japanese imperialism. And David's new book just came out this year from University of Washington Press. The title of the book is Seeds of Control, Japan's Empire of Forestry in Colonial Korea. Fabulous book title and a fabulous work I'm reading now. Congratulations to David. And Ian alum of uh, Felbank Center. <laughs> Very wonderful to see you again. Ian Miller is assistant professor of history at St. John's University in New York. Uh, Ian's research focuses on the long-term social and environmental history of China and also engages with world environmental history, forest history, energy history, and the research, uh, research methods in digital humanities. And also congratulations to Ian for his new book came out, just came out very recently from the same press, University of Washington Press. I believe actually two of your books are from the same book series, right? So amazing, what amazing. So the book title is A Fur and Empire, The Transformation of Forests in Early Modern China. So I believe today we will hear about your um, past and the present research, and we will carry out a conversation about your work. And we also look forward to hearing, uh, learning more about your future works, right? Building on seeds and fur. So awesome. So just to remind our audience, our talk, this event will last for about 80 minutes. We will um, def uh, ref um, turn to our 
speakers and they will carry out some conversation. We hope at the end, we will reserve 20, 30 minutes for Q&A. So if you have any question, if you have any thoughts, please type it down in the um, Zoom's function called Q&A. So um, I will act as the moderator to read out your question at the end during the Q&A section. Wonderful. Let me turn to Ian and David. How about each of you take about 10 minutes to introduce your past and present research uh, with us? Ian, how about you first? Uh, thanks so much, Ling. Um, so I really wanna thank Ling for inviting me to this. Um, you know, um, she's been really instrumental, I think, in shaping this field as it emerges. Um, and so um, it's just really exciting to be part of this. Um, and I'd also like to thank Mark Grady and the Fairbank Center um, you know, for organizing this and, um, and having everything move smoothly um, so far at least. Um, and I, I'm also just really delighted to be doing this with, with David um, whose work I, I've known about for a while and I really admire and frankly, who I followed to the University of Washington Press and had a really great experience there. Um, so it's, it's gonna be fun. I think to have this this conversation, um, I'm going to go ahead and share my screen um, real quick, and all right. And how's that look? Good. Okay. So I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the research um, in my book for an empire. Um, which is about the transformation of forests in early modern China. So I'm gonna start with fur, which is to say, I'm gonna talk a little bit about environmental change, and then I'll move on to empire and talk a little bit about the implications that this has for understanding institutional change. So in the forest history of China, um, and really in forest history in general, the first, his the first generation of scholarship has typically been dominated by the story of deforestation which is to say the removal of forest. And in the Chinese context, it's usually framed around the retreat of the megafauna. Um, in particular, building on Mark Elvin's um, seminal work, the, the retreat of the elephants. Um, Robert Marks also does some work using tigers. And this, is, this work has greatly advanced the field. It's what made me want to study forest history. Um, it makes forests a site of historical inquiry but it makes some simplifying assumptions about how people interact with forests. In particular, that the main thing that people do to forests is to get rid of them. And so one of the major interventions um, of my work is to qualify this understanding of deforestation. And so I argue that when natural growth forest is cut, it doesn't always retreat. Instead, forests planting often tended to follow the ax. Wood was just too important a resource in people's everyday lives. And in fact, it was too important for the state for sort of strategic goals as well. And so deforestation was what tended to happen when the system broke down, not when the forest system was working well. And instead what we saw is when the supply of natural growth forests shrank due to excessive cutting um, and in the face of consistent or growing demand, landowners planted more trees because they saw that they could make money by doing so. And what they mostly planted was fast growing conifers. And so um, in a nutshell, I wanna qualify the retreat of the elephants by showing that it was followed by the march of pine and fir. And these are the two trees that I'm talking about, principally the tree on the right, the China fir, Shan Mu, um, Cunninghamia lanceolata, um, and the other principal um, timber tree planted in South China is, um, is Masson's pine or horsetail pine, pine Ma Wei Song, the tree on, on the left. Um, and so the most important way that I, I track the, the spread of these two trees um, is with land registration. And um, so what I, what I show is that in the 12th century, forests became taxable property for the first time in Chinese history. Um, and over the next several hundred years, landowners registered their forests with the state to ensure that they would retain title to the land. And in the process, they were enclosing, enclosing forests that had previously been common pool resources. And they would only bother to pay taxes on these forests if they were economically productive, um, or maybe if they held graves, which is a, opens up a whole other can of worms that I'm happy to take questions about if you're interested. Um, and I estimate based on anecdotal evidence that two thirds to three quarters 
of economically productive forests that were registered with the state were timber forests and mostly fir forests. And the remainder were tea plantations, oil seed plantations, orchards, or, and things like that. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip the details on this registration data, but you can ask me about it later if you want to hear more. And what I'm just going to say is that if we look at the present day distributions of these two species, um, they have basically spread to the climatic limits where these species grow well. And my basic argument is that this is not um, a process that is based entirely on climate or on the natural seeding processes of these species, but they spread because people planted them. And, um, and so that's the sort of overarching environmental argument of my book. End of this research. Um, the second part of the story is institutional. And so in, in Europe, and I think to some degree in, in Japan, um, modern forestry began with state forestry institutions. And so the expectation that researchers came to China with was that we would see something similar, that forestry would be developed by the state. And instead, what I found is that the state was not particularly interested in doing territorial forestry because forestry is hard and it didn't yield very much revenue. Um, and so in fact, the actual practical aspects of forestry were mostly negotiated by contract among private landowners and forest laborers. And so using these contracts, um, what we see, especially in the 15th and 16th centuries is a transition from local forest economies where these actors are an overlapping set of people, where the landowners, the laborers, the merchants involved in timber economies overlap with each other. Um, but by the end of the 16th century, the, um, the famous Huizhou merchants are emerging um, as interregional merchants. And they first emerge on the scene as timber merchants. And they remain the most important timber wholesalers through at least the 1800s. Um, and there's another diaspora that's really important to this, which is the Hakas, who first emerge out of the mountains of, um, of Fujian and, and Jiangxi as in a pool of itinerant forestry and mining laborers. And what I argue was the first significant itinerant labor force that was not directed by the Chinese state. Um, and so what this incredibly productive private forestry sector allowed the state to do was to tax forest products when they entered the market instead of doing the very difficult work of surveying the forests themselves. And the single most important site of regulations was, was the tariff depots um, where, where logs sort of float into the market. Um, and this is where the Song, Yuan, Ming, and Qing states all collected, collected taxes on the timber shipments. And most of the time what they did with these taxes was that they used them to offset the state's demand for timber. Um, okay, and like in most of the early modern world, in China, the single most important strategic demand for timber was for the Navy. Um, and in early modern China, they used the timber tariff to feed directly into the shipyards. And so what you see on this slide is that the Ming shipyards in Nanjing actually developed standardized parts for their ships, which are labeled on these diagrams. And they obtained these parts directly from the nearby tariff station that we saw on the previous slide. And in fact, the manual on shipyard administration contains standardized forms for timber purchase, which is what you're seeing on this slide. It's actually four copies of the same form that track log dimensions and a bunch of other information and that standardize their preparation into the types of ship components that we saw on the previous slide. And the really cool thing about this is because they were carved onto wood blocks, they could basically Xerox off a bunch more um, you know, forms whenever they needed um, them by just re-inking the stored wood blocks. Um, and aside from the shipyards, there was one other really significant place where the state intervened directly to get timber. And this was to get the very large logs needed for palace building. And if you want to read about the architectural logic about why they needed such large logs, I highly recommend Aurelia Campbell's new book, What the Emperor Built. Um, I actually worked a little bit with Aurelia on this, um, and, and her work is, is just a fascinating um, look at the architectural side of this. My intervention is to show that when the state needed to be involved in logging, in this case to get a highly specialized supply of incredibly giant logs for palace building, it did get involved. Um, so the Ming and Qing sent out dozens of officials to map the parts of the Southwest where these giant trees could still be found to do tree counts, 
and pretty much all the other things that other early modern forest administrators did in Europe. There were literally tens, if not hundreds of thousands of workers on hand to construct slip roads, temporary bridges like the Feichiao, the flying bridge that you see in this slide, and these giant capstans um, to, to pull the logs up slopes. And in fact, the, um, the apparatus of Southwestern logging was massive, well-documented, and in fact, it is this picture that is largely respons responsible for the understanding of unrestrained deforestation across all of China that we see in the older scholarship. Um, so um, to conclude, here's some credits for the images um, I just showed, but I, I wanna argue that the net effect of China's early modern transition was a near total transformation of the forested landscape from mixed, largely naturally seeded forests that were treated as common pool resources to those planted largely by humans in just a handful of species that were treated as private property. Forest plantations could not replace the species diversity or the ecological services provided by old mixed growth forests, but they did keep the market supplied with timber and the land under some form of tree cover until a major crisis in the 19th and 20th centuries. And this also entailed a transformation in the institutions that controlled and profited from timber and other forest products. And private ownership and contractual management largely replaced common pool resources and menial labor service, the growing navy was supplied by a highly productive tariff on private timber markets, and when the state did feel the need to step in, it developed a prodigious bureaucratic apparatus to oversee logging in the southwest. Um, so that's that's the sort of overarching argument um, that I want to have sort of wanted to make in my work up to this point. Um, and so um, I'd be very happy to take questions on this, but I'd also really like to hear. Um, a little bit more about David's project before we get into that discussion. Yeah, let me quickly remind everybody, if you do have a question for Ian or comments, please type them out in the Q&A section for this Zoom um, this platform. Then let's turn to David first. Okay, uh, well, I'd like to echo Ian with uh, words of thanks to Ling, to Mark, uh, for all, to all of you for, for tuning in. Uh, good morning from a not so sunny Irvine. Uh, I'm gonna pull up my slides. Here we are. So I thought I would take the short amount of time that I have to just key you into four of the central arguments that run through my book. And this is more of a, a teaser. I'm not going to give you too much detail so that you might actually go out and buy the book and, and read it. Um, um, so I, I just want to highlight what I think are kind of the four um, interventions that, that have animated my research interests and, and that run through the, the book as a whole. Uh, in essence, Seeds of Control is uh, my attempt to write empire more fully into Japanese environmental history, but also to write the Japanese empire into global environmental history. Um, it pr proceeds from the, the rather simple premise that uh, in order to understand the verdant landscapes the Japanese people enjoy today at home, uh, we have to not only look back uh, to uh, their long traditions of forestry as Conrad Tottman has done, but we also need to look beyond the archipelago itself. And this I'm uh, building on arguments advanced by Bill Tsutsui, by Bina Art, who I know are both uh, signed in to this talk today. Um, uh, but I, I'm really trying to uh, map out the fuller scope of Japan's sylvan footprint, it, its uh, ecological footprint across the Asia Pacific. H historically, Japan in the 20th century, at least, has played an, an outsized role in uh, the management and control of forests across uh, the Pacific Rim, be they as a part of the colonial empire uh, before 1945 or in more recent decades through the uh, deforestation and extraction of timber from Southeast Asia, which has really been uh, central to Japan's own economy, its own uh, resource politics uh, over the last several uh, decades. Um, so while the book is 
rooted in Korea um, and develops arguments that are in many ways particular to Korea's colonial context, it also tries to tell a story of uh, what I call Japan's empire of forestry. It situates Korea within this broader empire-wide framework of, of forestry. Uh, and I, I try to understand um, the relationship between these different uh, forestry projects be it from uh, it, Karafuto in the north to um, Kalimantan in Southeast Asia. Uh, so uh, part of what I'm trying to do is, is to take a, a broader view of uh, Japanese forestry practices to understand how they traveled, what impact they had uh, beyond the home islands themselves. And in, in this respect, I think I'm, I'm trying to map out an alternative trajectory of green imperialism in Asia. Um, I'm arguing with global environmental historians who have uh, spilled a great deal of ink to, um, in advancing claims about the relationship between territorial expansion uh, and conservationist discourse, but they've done so largely from a European uh, metropolitan view. And, and uh, one of the things I'm hoping to do with this book is to put uh, the Japanese Empire in general and the Korean Peninsula in particular on the map of environmental historians who probably haven't spent a lot of time thinking about alternative traditions and politics of green imperialism uh, as they found expression uh, as a part of Japan's empire. Uh, so at, at, at one level, uh, the, the book is, is uh, pushing readers and thinkers to look beyond the green archipelago. And it builds, uh, Conrad Totman's work uh, of the same name, the green archipelago, is both a foundation and a foil for the book. I'm um, continuing forward a lot of the work that he's already done to, to try to understand the evolution of Japanese forestry practices into the era of industrial capitalism, into the era of high imperialism. Uh, but I'm also pushing back against uh, some of his claims, uh, and especially his sort of nation state uh, oriented approach to understanding uh, issues of sustainability, resource supply, and, and so on. At another level, uh, my book is um, an attempt to rethink the nature of state power. Uh, the, some of the main actors that, that populate the pages of my book are Japanese forestry bureaucrats. Uh, many of them pictured here. Um, and I was, I've was i always been struck in uh, the course of, of researching and writing this book, the degree to which these uh, bureaucrats really struggled uh, to implement their agenda. Uh, for all their confidence and scientific precision, they were routinely sent back to their drawing boards um, as they contended with market forces, with geopolitics, uh, with local resistance, uh, that was in many ways beyond their control. Uh, and this is a, a, a kind of a portrait of uh, the colonial bureaucracy and Japanese colonial experts that does not square neatly with my understanding of Ilcheha, of the, Jap the colonial state in, in Korea, um, that is quite often characterized as this faceless, seemingly omnipotent entity uh, that carries out the will of official, officialdom with ruthless efficiency. Um, and that's not really the case, at least as far as forestry is concerned. When viewed through the lens of the Bureau of Forestry in Colonial Korea, we, we see um, a more kind of human understanding of the, of the, of the colonial state itself. So uh, one, one of the things I do in the book is add a touch of human complexity uh, to the implementation of, of forest policy on the ground. Uh, I, I devote a, a good number of pages to the bureaucrats themselves so that we can understand their experiences, their motivations, their setbacks, their failures, uh, that all colored the forestry project in uh, different ways. So um, uh, this is uh, in, in some ways a, a, an attempt to better understand um, the kind of the limits of the state in implementing its agenda. And if there were ever spaces in colonial Korea that were recalcitrant to control, it, were, it was the uplands um, where uh, Hwajonmin, where uh, Sweden cultivators uh, persisted throughout the colonial period, despite uh, concerted efforts on the part of the colonial state to stamp out uh, Sweden, uh, where a guerrilla insurgency mounted uh, a resistance campaign um, that was a thorn in the side of the colonial state. They, they tried and largely failed to uh, control a lot of these regions. So uh, 
another piece of this is, is simply trying to better gauge the, the limits of colonial power by shifting, subverting our view and looking at uh, the, metropole, the metropole, looking at cities like Seoul uh, and rice paddies uh, from the perspective of these upland areas uh, that have by and large been pushed to the margins of scholarship on colonial Korea. I, I argue in the book that there's not only an urban bias in the study of colonial Korea, there's also an arable land bias. We uh, love to think and write a lot about the cultivation of rice and for very good reason. That's the lifeblood of the agrarian economy. Uh, but we often do so at the expense of the broader uh, woodlands and watersheds that surround them and that are interconnected in uh, a variety of important ways. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to kind of correct uh, both of those biases to, to a certain degree. I think one of the things that, uh, just based on my conversations with Ian over the years, that has drawn both of us to forests as objects of study is just their, their myriad uses. Forests are at once so many different things, even just at a material level. Um, and for that reason, I think they, they can often be really rich sites for investigating uh, social politics and social conflict on the ground. I mean, this isn't a particularly new or controversial observation, uh, but um, uh, forests often provide sort of a prism to understand all these different local stakeholders and, and uh, how they imbued forest space with different meanings. Uh, and one of the things I do in the book is, is uh, just that, to um, kind of tra trace the contours of conflicts over forest uh, management and utilization. Uh, to better understand what I call the materiality of modernization. Scholars of the Japanese empire love to make nods to the thickening network of railways uh, that uh, grows across the peninsula and into Man Manchukuo and, and beyond. Uh, well, th those rail ties, that project was not summoned from thin air. Uh, it was born of a um, intensive uh, industrial forestry project that fundamentally transformed forest conflict composition uh, that rewired uh, the um, political economy of, of Korea in important ways. Um, and, and so I, I devote considerable uh, space in the book to uh, trying to better understand kind of the, the resource politics and the sourcing of the material inputs and implications of Japan's developmental agenda in Korea. Um, I touch on everything from rail ties to telegraph poles to construction materials that were um, central to the development of settler enclaves. Um, uh, certainly the waves of Japanese settler colonialists themselves uh, place new pressures on uh, forests. Uh, and I think where this comes, finds the clearest expression is in the politics of fuel, uh, which is another um, Kind of major arena of, of uh, analysis in, in my book. I fuel, I think my book can be read as, a, as energy history. I mean, perhaps as much as Ian's can, uh, but there was something to me particularly compelling about uh, fuel politics, in part because it was so clear that Japanese colonial foresters weren't just concerned with upland areas, forests and mountains removed from society in these remote uh, regions, uh, they were just as concerned with the homes and hearths of colonial subjects and, and settlers themselves. Uh, increasingly over the course of the colonial period, they kind of turn their interest into the fireboxes uh, of um, their colonial subjects to better, um, to impose more resource discipline upon subjects. And this becomes a, a particularly acute uh, campaign uh, over the course of the war, uh, which is the final chapter of my book when uh, resource scarcity, austerity, frugality become uh, a central part of, of what it means to conserve on behalf of the emperor and his resplendent realm. Um, so materiality is, is uh, another key piece of my research. And I think this is also an intervention in the study of colonial Korea, which has for quite some time been discourse heavy in its analysis. Uh, so there's both been, an, there's clearly an imperial turn in Japanese studies. Uh, my generation of scholars have overwhelmingly turned to the empire. Uh, maybe not overwhelmingly, but a good number of them have. 
but likewise, I think there's been a, a material turn. Uh, mine is one of a good number of studies that are coming out now or in the works that are really trying to better understand the material underpinnings of the Japanese uh, empire. And lastly, um, I, I try in the book to uh, puzzle through, to rethink or think more critically about the greening of landscapes as being a singularly positive thing. We tend to associate reforestation, land reclamation uh, with, a, with uh, positive meanings, uh, benevolent intentions. Um, and the case of colonial Korea, I think, should prompt us to also think in terms of a darker shade of green. Uh, I um, develop arguments throughout the book uh, about the greenificationism of the colonial state. And th this is a term I'm borrowing from the Korean historian Lee uh, Uyeon, who show, we, we both show how reforestation operated as uh, a platform for social control and coercion. Uh, so we need to think more carefully about uh, reforestation and, and the benefits uh, that, that come with it. Uh, in the case of colonial Korea, it was carried out on the backs of agrarian communities, and it was very much to the benefit of corporations and capitalists. So um, I'm trying to, in, in a manner I think not unlike Ian, um, push back against simplistic narratives of deforestation as being kind of the defining story of uh, Chinese history or of uh, the environmental implications of Japanese rule in Korea, to show that, well, actually, there's, it's, it's more complicated than that, that silviculture is um, just as, as central to this process, and that when we look beyond hacking, reaping, and sawing as being the stories of Japanese colonial rule, we can better understand how planting, sowing, uh, and protecting were just as important to um, how the Japanese set out to control the land and uh, the subjects within it. Um, I will stop there um, so that we can open it up to, to a Q&A, but I look forward to your thoughts and questions. Fantastic. Thank you, David. Um, there's just a, so much go uh, in your talk and in Ian's talk. It just reminded me the things that we commonly were commonly interested in: the power of the state, the resource uh, uh, management, environmental management, and also how local society play their role in it. And I must say. Personally, I'm most struck by this black and white image of the piles, piles of the timber, the timber stock, right, waiting to be pulled away to be translated, uh, trans transported to somewhere else or by a railway. And this speaks to me so strongly. I mean, uh, partly because my uh, I've been working on timber issue a little bit, but folks on North China, of course, a, a much earlier time. So in my old work, I tried to calculate in terms of the quantity of the amount of the timber and and vegetative material overall being collected by the Song state for the sake of uh, uh, repairing dikes and uh, embankments for river. So, uh, but looking at this image, the representation of the sheer amount of material gathered, it's really uh, astonishing. So anyhow, thank you so much go, uh, for, for, for your two of your wonderful introduction of your work. And I can already tell there's so much resonance between you two. And I really wanted to put this question out to two of you. You've been following each other, befriending each other over years, been communicating for uh, over years. And then you touch upon similar kind of a research issues. Can you tell us a little bit how you see the comparison between your work? What's the commonalities? Uh, what are the differences? And do you share certain methodologies, certain theoretical, and you already met, touch upon certain things, right? Share something with us. Two of you, please. Ian? Should I go first? Sure, why not? Um, so I think there are a few things that, um, that I've really learned from David's work and from conversations we've had, um, and that also just a shared focus on forests and trees sort of nurtures. And, and one of these is the materiality, which is something that came out um, a lot in, um, in David's um, presentation just now. Um, and so, you know, in the pre-modern context, forests provide just a huge array of goods. And the most obvious is structural timber and fuel. But on top of that, you know, it's 
Um, it's materials for waterproofing, it's famine foods, it's fodder um, and green fertilizer um, and, and all of these different things. I mean, umbrellas are getting, you know, all of these different things um, are getting made from forest products. Um, and so paying attention just to the materiality of, um, of these sort of objects of consumption um, or of these large scale state projects like you were talking about in terms of river dikes, um, in terms of palaces, uh, in terms of ships, um, that's in you know the pre-modern period. But as David pointed out, even moving into the, the modern period, there's so much material that's still being taken out of the forest. Um, railroad ties is something he brought up. I know that David is, is working also a lot on paper, um, which is a you know sort of a very um, especially just the explosion of newsprint is a particularly modern um, use of, of forest products and and all of these other things. Um, and so attention to the materiality is one of them. Um, I think another thing is just thinking about trees through their life cycles. And, um, and so one way of thinking about, I think a move that both David and I are trying to make is that the attention used to be focused on um, when humans kill trees, right? When people kill trees, the, the cutting of trees, which actually doesn't always kill them, but that's another, right? Um, and so it was the end of the life cycle, the artificial, imposition of an end to a tree's life cycle. But um, one of the things that we see is that humans interfere with trees throughout, right? They plant them, they prune them, they thin the stands. Um, and then there's also the, the question of fire, um, which is very topical these days. And, and both the, the intentional use of fire um, as a way of, of thinning the forest landscape and making it better um, for, for hunting and things like that, um, or for Sweden farming, but also the exclusion of fire from the landscape, um, which is necessary if you want to obtain this, this harvest of mature timber. Um, and um, so I think that thinking in those terms um, makes us pay attention to afforestation as well as deforestation um, as well as all of the other things in between. Um, and I, I think the other thing that came out in David's talk in particular, and that's something that I've been thinking about a lot, is thinking beyond borders and thinking about the way that there are different regional differences, but also the way that, that materials flow between regions. Um, and I, I think that that's a really critical piece of, of David's scholarship. And it's something that has me thinking a little bit more about how this functions in the Chinese context that it's really the, um, you know, it's in some ways the removal of old growth from some regions to get just easy sources of timber that enables the, the afforestation of other regions. Um, and that's a really interesting turn. Um, and thinking about the way that the frontiers of, of logging move, um, not just in the pre-modern period, but into the modern period and well into, you know, contemporary situations is another really interesting theme that I think runs through this. Um, I, I agree uh, wholeheartedly. I, I think the most obvious and, and striking linkage between our work is silviculture. Um, we both really try to better understand the processes underlying the regeneration, um, afforestation, processes of afforestation. Um, we, there are a couple of similarities, I think, in terms of emphasis, um, things that tie our work together, but, but that we approach in fundamentally different ways. And those are what are what's particularly interesting to me. One of them is the marketplace. Uh, we both write extensively about the market, but I think we arrive at different conclusions about the role that the market played in shaping the forestry project. Um, my sense uh, from your work is that the market did a lot of what the state bureaucracy would not, uh, at least early on, and you can you can uh, finesse that for me uh, if, if you like. Um, for the foresters that I write about, the market was uh, a major thorn in their side. They, they routinely struggled uh, to um, redraw at their plans to better um, align with market forces uh, that were taking shape in other parts of the empire. Um, so you, you spoke uh, there uh, briefly in about kind of the transnational flow of forest resources. That's, I, I kind of failed to mention that in my talk, but when we're talking about Korea's forest commodities, 
a lot of them are being shipped uh, back to the archipelago or north uh, into Manchuria, um, and they are not being consumed within uh, Korea its, itself. So one of the real challenges for me as a researcher was just to make sense of the material flows uh, that, that kind of grew in tandem with Japan's own exper imperial expansion. It's, it's a really complicated kind of dizzying set of, of forces, uh, but it was, um, uh, it hobbled the forestry project in Korea because they quite simply couldn't anticipate what the expansion into new markets meant for um, pricing schemes for futures and timber commodities. So uh, I view the market as um, kind of a, a, con a complicating factor that got in the way, uh, uh, kind of threw a monkey wrench in the plans of these foresters. And I, I wonder if um, what accounts for our kind of divergent views on the, the place of the market in these uh, forestry projects. It's a really interesting question. Um, I mean, I think that to some degree, it's because you just have more data. And, and so the, um, I mean, I'm in a situation where I have to make do with the limited amounts of data that I have. And I think that you're in something of the opposite situation where there's more data than you can puzzle through. Um, and th there are, I mean, there's certainly moments when the market is a problem. Um, so certainly for the Ming founder, the market is a problem. And, um, and he tries to um, take the market out of the equation. Um, there's also a moment actually in the, in the late Northern Song when, when state forestry almost happens and then it doesn't. Um, and, and I wonder how much of this is because um, you know, you're able to write a history of 40 or 50 years with a huge amount of depth and insight into what all these officials are thinking about. Um, and there's just not that, that level of detail. Um, and there, so there are certainly intervals where maybe things look similar to that, um, but we just don't know. Um, and also just, especially because of railroads and because of the incredible extent of the Japanese empire. I mean, this is something that I, I actually would be interested. I know that your book is principally about Korea, um, but what are Japanese foresters doing to think about the needs of afforestation or the needs of management, you know, in Karafuto versus in, you know, eventually in the South Seas mandate, right? Or, um, or in Taiwan. Um, and so um, there's a, you know, there's a sort of, but the markets are just much faster moving and more integrated um, in part as a result of the, you know, the modern transportation technologies and in part as a function of just how many degrees of latitude the Japanese empire covers. So I want to actually, since we are, uh, the, the time actually go run so fast, but this conversation is so fascinating, but I, so, so that's why I'm going to move us to another topic and the related to what Ian just mentioned, sources. And I'm working on Northern Song, right, North China, even less sources. So each of us face, you know, different sets of challenges when it comes to study environmental history, ecological history, and the, the issues that we care about, materiality of the trees, of uh, timber, right, really cared about, right, concerned about by pre-modern, especially the statesmen, statesmen, politicians, or local elites, right? So how did you cope with uh, uh, challenges in your your research and what kind of innovation, what kind of a secret you've devised. And uh, in the general picture also, we're talking about, you both mentioned world environmental history and forest studies, energy studies. What are the available tools that you've encountered that we East Asian environmental historian can actually learn from? And I, the reason I'm asking this is because I can see in our audience and uh, list that there are many uh, graduate students are currently are moving into environmental history, any advice or any sharing from you will be tremendously helpful to them. David, do you want to go first this well, time? I was going to say something about your, your own work, uh, which was to point uh, readers to the really helpful note you have at the back of your book um, about the, the research process. It's something I wish more of us did, uh, but uh, Ian has uh, elected to, he, to publish three or four pages 
uh, a reflection on uh, what it means to write forest history through digital archives, um, which struck me as uh, really useful, uh, both in terms of just the, he can point you to some of the resources, the databases that are, are out there, um, but this is the way of the world right now. Um, and uh, it's something that I'm not particularly comfortable with yet. For me, uh, there's real power in being able to visit the forests themselves. Um, and that's something that I think is, is well, it's, uh, it's not possible when writing about the period that you're writing about. But for me, I'll, uh, some of my breakthroughs in the research and writing process came as a result of hiking and backpacking and being in these places and hearing stories that people told about the land, reading the landscape itself. Um, so whenever that's possible, I would encourage students, scholars to uh, get their boots dirty and to get outside and to think about the landscape and these forests as archives in their own right. Um, but obviously that's not possible uh, for a wide range, in, in, probably in most cases. Um, and we live in a world where digital archives provide um, access to uh, unimaginable amounts of, of material at, at this point. A lot of my own research uh, was done through um, the digitization of materials at the National Diet Library, Korea's, uh, the, the Library of, of Korea. Um, and um, Ian is exactly right. I was just overwhelmed by the sheer amount of material. Um, uh, there was no lack of sources. So the challenge for me uh, was homing in on the right types of sources, but also reading them with uh, the right degree of, of scrutiny. I think we, uh, for example, I encountered in the course of my archival research, reams and reams of statistics uh, on forest cover that allowed me to uh, tell what seemed like a, a fairly precise story of changes to forest composition, forest cover. Um, and it was quite tempting to just lean heavily on those sources to make claims about the legacies and transformation of the landscape under Japanese colonial rule. But that's uh, uh, a very dangerous uh, mindset. Um, uh, you, th those same statistics need to be handled with care and scrutiny and with uh, recognition of the biases that are built into the categorization of landscapes uh, and the, the ways in which the colonial state and its bureaucrats kind of projected their own set of values onto the land as they measured it. I think this is something that comes through in both of our emphasis and analysis of the land surveys or woodland surveys that are so central to how the state um, makes claims to uh, tenure rights. Um, and, and so for me, one of the big challenges was not only kind of negotiating the sheer breadth of material, but, but figuring out how to sort out the, the rhetoric uh, uh, of colonial officialdom from the reality on the ground. And that required me to triangulate sources, to not just use statistics, but to look at photographs, look at traveler accounts, uh, in some cases, look at ecological data, what scientists were writing, um, what, what they had been able to recreate based on things like um, um, pollen samples, for instance. I would point you here in the case of colonial Korea, or Korea to John Lee's work as well, who's done I think a better job than I have in, in uh, making sense of what scientists have to contribute to forest history. Yeah, I, I think that this, this notion of triangulating between different sources, in particular to figure out what these figures mean, is really important. Um, I mean, there are clear differences in the source bases that we're talking about. Um, I mean, in my case, bureaucrats are still trying to figure out what it means that a forest is like a bounded surveyed um, place. That's not something that it was before. And actually one of the things that, um, that I puzzled out is that the terms and the number of different terms and the number of different categories used to parse forests or forest type lands is in flux for about 200 years. And then it gets more or less standardized, but it's much less granular than the type of surveys um, that, that David um, is working with. Um, and, um, you know, because there isn't this sort of Forstwissenschaft type of, you know, like scientific forestry mindset yet. Um, and so they're not even trying to collect, nor do they have the capacity to collect 
the degree of the data with the degree of specificity that you would be looking at in um, in 20th century surveys. Um, but it's still really important to think about this in terms of alternative perspectives, which in my case largely comes from contracts and land deeds. And, um, and the thing that's sort of both fascinating and frustrating there is that um, the details that I care about as an environmental historian and an economic historian are the ones that are so banal that they leave them out. You know, and so everybody knows how you plant a fir and, or how you plant a slope with fir trees. And so nobody writes how you do that. And the only times that there are, there are more, the, the, these more detailed renderings of what's going on are when people are either making innovations or when there's a problem. And, um, and so you have to, you know, I mean, I read thousands of these to find maybe 20 or 30 that have a level of, of interesting detail, which is still much less than what the forest scientists um, that David is reading have to say about it, because um, they just, the, the field of study has not developed in, in that way. Um, I mean, in terms of digital sources, the, I mean, this turned out to be very important to the project because there was not a, um, you know, a board of forestry. Um, th there was something, I guess, a little bit like that in the Southwest for this large scale logging project, but otherwise there was not. And so the information is spread across all different institutions, different people, and stuff like this. And so what I was able to do with digitized sources is to follow the tree um, because I could use the tree as a search term. And, um, and it turns out that the, you know, the character Shen is, is like a perfect search term because it only gives me what I want. It's not used in, all, it's used to some degree in place names, but otherwise it's almost never used except to talk about the tree um, and but on the other hand because this tree is so universal um, in at least south Chinese forestry it gets this immense breadth of material as well um, and so I think paradoxically that actually made this a project that could only really be done with digitized sources um, that being said I mean I agree with David also that th the importance of, of getting boots on the ground is is really I mean, so the trees that I'm writing about are, are mostly dead. Um, supposedly, the trees that are on Jushi's grandmother's grave um, are still standing. You know, were planted by Jushi in you know the the 12th century, and they and like two thirds of them are still alive apparently. But that's an incredibly exceptional case that you have trees that are still standing from 800 years ago. Um, but at the same time. Um, if you read what, um, what sort of um, arborists have been writing about how, you know, the limited amount they've been writing about how to do tree planting from basically the 13th century all the way through to what um, apparently was going on in, you know, communist forestry in the 50s, um, and to some degree still today, it's very, very similar. And so to some degree, you can walk in a, you know, in a fir plantation today and get some sense um, while the specifics have changed of, of the, the sort of lived experience. Um, and so I think that that's also incredibly important. Fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing your insights, um, your frustration, and then your creative ways to negotiating with the challenges. And it's so wonderful to hear this. And I really resonate with the, your, uh, both of you, your senti sen sentiment, uh, sen sentiment. We share so little with each other during the many years of a very lonely work. I think we should create more opportunity in the future to talk about the experience. Uh, I, I really resonate with that. So we're really running out of time, uh, but uh, in order to allow us to preserve more time to, uh, to do q and I'm just gonna give each of you one and a half minutes. Tell us what you're working on now. What's your new exciting projects? One and a half minutes, each of them. <laughs> um, David, go first. I'll, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, my new uh, project that I'm laying the groundwork for now is um, a history of the OG paper company uh, and the politics of pulp in Asia. 
um, OG or Dai OG as it's sometimes celebrated, uh, was uh, and remains Japan's largest corporate consumer of forests across Asia. Um, it uh, was the project of uh, Shibusawa Eiichi, uh, uh, one of the founding fathers of Japanese capitalism, uh, and has been kind of front and center in the process of Japan's kind of expansion and control of forests um, outside of Japan. So I want to tell kind of the story of Japan's print culture. Uh, we, we love to celebrate uh, the explosion in, of newspapers, the um, uh, packaging and paper that attended urban modernity in Japan. And this is going to be my, my effort to kind of better understand the material underpinnings of Japanese uh, paper and print culture by looking to the single corporation that was the engine of uh, resourcing all of the pulp that went into these projects. So it's a corporate history, it's a history of capitalism, and it's a history that's going to push me uh, primarily into Southeast Asia, where OG today operates 30 plus factories, manufacturing everything from diapers to newspapers to tissues and so on. Wow, fascinating. Uh, Ian. Yeah, so um, I guess in some ways my new project is my old project. Um, I'm, I'm getting back to some things I had been working on before on um, lineage management of village landscapes. Um, and um, there's, there's a few pieces to this. Some of it is looking at feng shui forests, um, especially around graves and temples. Um, some of it is also tying that to lineage control of land holding. And, um, and lineage trusts. Um, and also the third piece is sort of management of migration. And so management of the population base um, and really seeing um, the kinship organization and, um, and the sort of ecological management of the setting as very much tied together. Um, and um, a lot of this is inspired as well by the need to puzzle out the renegotiation of common pool resources once they're coming under new threats. Um, so one of the big takeaways of this project was that there's all of this common pool forest land that has been enclosed as private land. And so um, part of what I wanna get at is what happens to the rest of it. You know, There's still a need for common pool resources um, especially for fuel, as well as to protect watersheds and things like that. And so how do those get renegotiated in this context where so much of the forest has been privatized? Fabulous project. Um, well, uh, before we go to the q and I just want to very quickly say I'm so excited about your projects. So immediately something popped into my mind. So the paper related issue. So there's a paper related issue for David, your new project. I was actually thinking about it when Ian was talking about his work. So this popularity, the flourishing of a printing industry in late imperial China, the wood block printing and also paper making, all of them should have consumed so much wood, right, in late imperial times. And also on the other hand, right, the use of a toilet toilet tissues, the global revolution of adopting toilet tissues uh, must have been the most, you know, ecological transformation for our world, right? Mm -hmm. So, so fascinating, but I'm not going to talk more. I'm going to communicate with you se separately. So we have some, wow, a lot number, a large number of questions, and they're so excellent. By no means we can cover everything. So I'm just going to handpick. Sorry, everybody. I, it's possible we not be able, we won't be able to cover all the questions. So uh, I'm just going to pick several. But first of all, let me call out the two persons I think are instrumental in shaping your intellectual life. So I'm going to call out two questions. So for David, let me point to Professor Bill Tsutsui's question. It has been well documented how Japanese bureaucrats and businessmen used colonial Manchuria as a prototype for a model of industrial development that they hoped might be implemented back in Japan. Was this a part of the colonial project in forestry in Korea as well? Was there a aspiration among imperial forests to pioneer programs in Korea that could be a model to re for reform in Japan? 
And let me very quickly read out Professor Peter Ball's question to Ian. So Ian, Ian you can think about it. <laughs> Thinking about demand for large logs from the 12th century on, is it possible to measure the proportions of the different sources of a demand, such as a government buildings, a military religious building, uh, lineage hall buildings? So, okay, let's turn to David first. Uh, well, thank you for the excellent question. Um, the there, are, I, I guess, two two ways I want to answer this. One is to say that. Uh, the forestry project in Korea is um, a model for foresters back in Japan, actually during the wartime period. As early as the 1930s, Japanese forestry bureaucrats are looking to Korea to try to better understand how they can launch breakneck reforestation programs back at home. Uh, so they recognize, I, th I think they see from 1937 onwards, what the colonial state in Korea had been doing in terms of um, sort of mobilizing the, the broader public, outsourcing the heavy lifting of reforestation on the uh, backs of uh, agrarian communities, they saw that as um, an, a wartime exigency. Uh, and so I, I, in the book, I believe it's in chapter six or chapter seven, I, I talk about how these forestry bureaucrats back in Japan during wartime uh, began to study what they saw unfolding in Korea, things like ceremonial plantings, uh, the proliferation of civic forestry bodies uh, that were the engines for reforestation and conservation efforts, uh, and also that offered, offered new pathways for caloric control during wartime. So it's a model, not even in the post-war, but as, as early as, as the war itself. But to me, the most striking kind of parallel and the, the real afterlife of the colonial forestry project in Korea is reforestation under Pak Chung-hee. Um, the uh, Korea's forest miracle during the 1960s and 1970s under uh, Park Chung-hee's developmental dictatorship. Uh, it bears striking parallels to what the colonial state had done before it. There are institutional legacies, scientific legacies. A lot of the foresters, the brain trust at the center of reforestation in South Korea under Park, cut their teeth in uh, the uh, colonial bureaucracy, um, and they deploy many of the same uh, techniques of erosion control, uh, ondol reform, kind of uh, fuel efficiency reforms, uh, and they launch a war on Sweden agriculture in, in much the same way the colonial state had before it. So uh, in the conclusion of the book, I, I really speak to the primary legacies of this project as they were manifest in post-colonial South Korea. Should, um, yeah, so Peter, thanks for the question. Um, and this is something that I, I really would love to be able to break down the demand for large logs according to um, the, you know, the different users, government buildings, military, and so on. Um, I have not found, I mean, there's not a good enough centralized um, uh, bureaucracy overseeing this. And so the closest that we could come would be on a local or regional basis. And I think that it would have to work backwards from some figures that we do know. So for example, um, we do know what the tax rates were on timber. So how much of the timber that was going into the market centers was taken by the state. And so that's a pretty good proxy for how much of the, um, of the market timber is going to official purposes, um, which by the Ming mostly means shipbuilding. Um, and so in the Ming, the, the tax rate on, on fir timber was 1 30th, so about 3%. Um, and they would buy um, a little bit of extra if they needed it or, or sell off extras if they had more timber than they needed. So it's not exact, but I think that that's a fairly decent estimate of how much of at least the Nanjing timber market was skimmed off for shipbuilding purposes. Um, in the Song, the rates were much higher. Um, in the Southern Song, they, they were about 30%, I, I believe, um, on large timber moving into Hangzhou. Um, I don't know what they were earlier than that. Um, and, and the rates were higher in Beijing than in Nanjing in, in, this, um, in the Ming, um, but also relatively low. Uh, the other place that we have fairly good data is on the Ming logging operations. 
most of the data from the Yongle period, which was probably the single biggest logging operations done in China until the 20th century, um, is lost. Um, uh, there are sort of uh, estimates from afterward based on how many logs were left over, which was a, still a pretty astounding figure. I think there were something like 400,000 large logs left from the Yongle era projects as of the, the 1440s. Um, but from the 16th and, um, and 17th centuries, there are much better estimates of the yield of, of logging in the Southwest. But again, this is specifically for palace building purposes. And I don't know where um, we'll be able to find comparable figures for other sectors that are using logs. Um, I would speculate that maybe by the 18th or 19th century, there are good enough records from like merchant account books that that, that would be possible. Um, but it, it's it's really sort of an open question, um, uh, but a very interesting one. Great. I don't we have more questions. So let me put out the two first. So for David, there is one question coming from um, Stephen Zhu. I guess how to pronounce uh, uh, zoo. Uh, um, and how did the Japanese forestry policy in Korea and other colonies differ from that in Japan proper, and for what purpose? A lot of a comparison, I suppose. And Ian, we have a question appointed from our friend, Jonathan Schlesinger. Um, let's see, Jonathan said, I think your work is so important and fascinating. I'm thrilled to be in the audience today. I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more about whether you see any significant geographical variations in your research. In the old quote unquote retreat, framework, for example, more apt for the north than the south. I think of the north as being deforestated in relatively early time. So perhaps the geography question is actually one about periodization, or perhaps I'm just mistaken. Should I go first? Yeah, go ahead. Um, well, thank you, Stephen. Uh, for the question. It's a it's a mighty big one. Uh, there are a lot of different ways I, I could uh, approach it. I, I suppose I'll, I'll just focus on Japan and Korea. One of the things I do make clear in uh, the introduction to the book where I kind of set up this notion of uh, a, the Japanese empire of forestry is that there is considerable variation across the empire. Um, it, it, we can't just assume that there's this unifying framework that Japanese foresters um, implemented the same sets of, of policies and had the same inclinations in landscapes as different as the Manchurian taiga and the tropical forests of Taiwan. Um, so I, I think it's important to recognize and appreciate the kind of managerial adaptation and variation that defined the Japanese empire of forestry. It, it simply had to, given the geography of the empire itself. So um, uh, there are lots of, of ways to, to kind of tease out those differences from uh, colony to colony, from climate to climate. Um, as far as the homeland versus the home islands versus um, uh, the Korean peninsula is concerned, um, they are, um, some of the pressing questions, burning issues of forestry are the same. Uh, centralization uh, of forest management is, marks a huge shift in the Meiji period. And so you can see the kind of the closing of the commons uh, is, a, uh, is central to the rolling out of a new forestry project in both Japan and Korea. Um, so there are villagers in the, uh, highlands of the uh, Seto Inland Sea, who are whose frustration with the state is um, very much aligned with uh, Sweden cultivators in upland Korea. Uh, so uh, there are important parallels that that you uh, can observe uh, in both places. Uh, one of the fundamental differences, as I see it, um, uh, in the colonial forestry project in Korea is the fact that by the time the Korean Peninsula was annexed uh, in 1910, uh, deforestation was a significant problem in the southern parts of the peninsula. Uh, it, 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 and I, I try in the book to, to offer up some explanations for what accounts for deforestation in the late, in the 19th century, the late Choson period. Uh, 
uh, but for the colonial officials, uh, they need to reforest uh, the southern part of the peninsula and to do so really quickly. Uh, and that concern, this uh, pervading concern that um, uh, deforestation is but the prelude to environmental ruin writ large, uh, that it leads to siltation, which leads to flooding, which leads to drought, that the climate itself was out of whack. Uh, that's the, the burning concern of these forestry bureaucrats. So they prioritize rapid reforestation over pretty much all other things. Uh, and in that sense, it's, it's quite different than what you see. Of course, there are bald mountains back in Japan as well. Um, but the, the scope of them and the degree to which these bald mountains and discourses of deforestation, uh, red, red uh, bald mountains and red earth um, comes to inform the particular ways, what I call the greenification framework uh, erected by these colonial bureaucrats uh, is uh, one of the distinguishing features of the forestry project uh, in Korea. It's uh, at the heart of woodland tenure redistribution policies, uh, how maps of woodland ownership are redrawn. Um, reforestation, silviculture is used as a, a mechanism to expropriate, to bleed off lands to Japanese corporations who really undertake the heavy lifting of costly capital intensive reforestation projects. Um, so uh, that and all of the politics of settler colonialism and colonial occupation, I think are different. Uh, it, it's not difficult to imagine why uh, Korean communities, farming communities in particular, would um, approach colonial bureaucrats with a skepticism and a uh, resistance that they didn't encounter back in the homeland. And that's true of uh, agrarian communities across the empire. I mean, there are plenty of stories of forest surveyors in Taiwan, for example, uh, 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 finding themselves in violent confrontations with upland communities. Uh, that's also true of, of Korea. So the intensity, the vitriol that and skepticism that local communities had uh, for the face of forestry officialdom, uh, I think is another aspect of forest politics that is particular to the colonial context. Yeah, so um, thanks John for this. This is a really great question. And I think that you're absolutely right that there are very important regional differences. Um, I mean, I have, I always have this sort of heuristic in, in the back of my mind when I sort of like, you know, draw an X um, across um, China and think of there as being sort of four regions that have fairly distinct forestry regimes. And like, as you point out, the North China Plain has been deforested since early history, if it ever had extensive forests, um, which I think is, is in some ways an open question. Um, and so in the North China Plain, there, aside from some uplands like the, the, Shen, um, you know, the Shandong Massif and some of the mountains ringing the plain, there's really very little natural forest, um, except maybe in some low-lying marshy areas. And so um, the emphasis is very much on village woodlots, um, on poplar and willow growing along roads and dikes um, and, um, and things like that. And also um, large timber, has been imported into the North China Plain since um, since very early in its history um, from both the West and the South. Um, and the Northwest is another sort of distinct region because it's so mountainous. There, there are um, typically a lot of, of forests there, but it's also um, sort of an ecotone, right? And it's an ecotone that shifts over time. And so forests that grow well and sometimes there get become ecologically marginal because there's not enough rainfall um, or because of rampant erosion in other periods. Um, and so there's actually a very different um, institutional basis of forestry there. It has um, certainly in some parts of the Northern Song and in the Ming, um, the military has a heavy hand in um, in the, the forestry practices there. And, and I tend to see it as more running on a boom and bust cycle. Um, and there's a lot more pine. Um, and the South is, um, you know, the South, the Southeast is really the heart of my study. And this is where, you know, it's the heartland of Cunninghamia, of the China fir, where these afforestation um, practices take off. And this is the only place in China um, where you see privately owned forests um, in the tax books. Um, you know, in the North or in the Northwest, you don't see them. Village woodlots are treated differently um, administratively. And then the Southwest is this zone that for a very long time is behind a sort of ethno-ecological barrier where Han loggers are not allowed there. 
um, according to regulations that are basically negotiated between Chinese states um, in, in the Southeast or the East and these non-Han people in the uplands. Um, in the Song, there was actually, they, they actually stuck a, um, a chain across the river and the, the regulation was literally that Han uh, merchants and loggers were not allowed to go up river of the chain and non-Han loggers were not supposed to go past the chain. Um, and there are variants of this um, later in, in history. And I see the Ming and in fact, the Yongle reign as the real watershed where Han loggers cross this pale. Um, and so absolutely the story of deforestation is different in different regions. Um, and the periodization is, is very different. You know, with the North China Plain, wood poor since at least the Qin Han period, the, the you know, the, war, the late warring states, the Qin Han period. Um, and, you know, South China, the Southeast, um, Jiangnan goes through its sort of wood supply crisis, I think in, in the 11th and 12th centuries. Um, and that's when afforestation kicks in as a, as a way of offsetting this problem. Um, in, and when we're talking about megafauna, which is the other sort of piece of this question, um, part of it is about regional differences, but part of it is also that different types of forests support fauna in you know, different ways. Um, in Chris Coggins' first book, he did some really interesting field work on this. Um, where, you know, um, and, and showed that actually, you know, sort of natural mixed growth forests are the best place for most wild fauna, but they do okay in certain other marginal environments. And so when we're thinking about um, elephants or tigers or, um, you know, or certain types of birds or things like that, each of them has a different preferred habitat and deals differently with, with um, damage to their habitat or, um, or human modification. And so there's also this complication of how we think about using megafauna as proxies for environmental change. What type of environmental change is that actually proxying? Um, and so in the case of elephants, um, you know, I think that they don't, uh, uh, they don't do well in, in these types of, of conifer forests, but my understanding is the tigers still do okay. Um, and so, you know, the, the stories um, that, that the, the animals tell is also going to be different um, depending on the animal, as well as depending on the region. Um, and I mean, there, there's some ways of getting at that as well. Um, there's some really fascinating data um, that we can um, take out of the reports of tributary products. Um, coming out of, of different regions. Um, and so in particular, where you can see um, Bienhe has done some really interesting work on this, um, that there are products that, used, that you used to be able to get in say central Jiangxi or in Northern Fujian um, that because the environment has changed are no longer, they're no longer able to grow there because they're wild plants. But, and so they're now buying them from further in the Southwest. Um, but actually, um, you know, there are some of these older centers that used to grow those plants that, that are still known as, um, as places where those drugs come from, but they're actually now buying them from further afield. Um, and, and in Fujian, there's also some, some really interesting records of how the, um, the, they were supposed to supply um, pelts to, um, to the, uh, the imperial court. And of course, the yield of wild animal pelts changes when um, when the ecology changes. And I don't know how, how well that's going to map onto tracing um, the ecological change, but it's another really interesting um, sort of set of observations to work from. Um, but the, the basic, I, I think I should end there. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, there's so much to talk about, but we're approaching the end. I do want to mentioned two questions here. Actually, both of them direct, directed to both of you. So, but I'm going to ask you just to each of you spend no more than two minutes to pick a question, however you would like to ask, answer which one you want to pick or if you can manage to answer both. So one question bo uh, to both of you from uh, Professor Steve Harrow. The question is, is the greater involvement of the Japanese colonial state compared to the Ming Qing imperial state? 
simply another aspect of the well-known fiscal poverty and the low taxation rates of the Qing dynasty, not only as compared to the imperial Japan, but also to Tokugawa regime. So this is one question. And then the other question uh, from uh, Yi Fei Song. Um, Yi Fei Song says, I am in California. Fire has been getting worse over time. Was wildfire related to forestry a serious problem for Japan or, or China or Japan in history? So two minutes each, pick whatever you would like to answer. I'm going to take the fire question, both because I'm also in California and also and because I want to lay this huge question comparing the Japanese empire to the whole sweep of Chinese history for Ian to answer in two minutes. So good luck with that, buddy. Um, fire absolutely figures into uh, the colonial forestry project. Uh, it figures into Ian's own research in all sorts of ways. It's interconnected um, with um, forest management uh, for a, a wide variety of reasons. There's both, there's anthropogenic fire, uh, there's natural wildfire. So it depends on what kind of fire we're talking about. Uh, the type of fire that figures most prominently into my own research is um, Sweden agriculture, fire set by farmers for shifting cultivation. Um, in the eyes of colonial officialdom, uh, these were the boogeymen of deforestation. Uh, they, their own agenda of Sweden of shifting cultivation was inimical to the colonial state's own um, view of what a, a productive, modernized, predictable, uh, legible landscape looked like. Uh, so they try and largely fail to stamp out uh, fire um, uh, in, large, in large part because it's something that they can't control. When the reality is that if you look at shifting cultivation practices, there's a rich body of research on this, much of it conducted by anthropologists. Uh, shifting cultivation, or as sometimes disparaged as slash and burn agriculture, is often uh, as sustainable uh, a, a way of um, uh, producing agriculture as, as any other. Um, so um, uh, there's a lot more that can be did can, that can be said when we look beyond the knee-jerk pyrophobia of uh, states and their forestry officials. Um, okay, so I will try to answer Steve Harrell's um, very big question. And um, this is, you know, with the caveat that this is going well outside the bounds of my expertise. Um, I think that there are time dimension, you know, temporal dimensions of the differences between Japan and the Japanese colonial empire and Mingqing China, as well as pretty substantial institutional differences. So if you were to go to say 17th or 18th century Japan or 17th or 18th century France or Germany and look at the forest systems um, and the amount of information that they produce um, and, um, and the level of involvement of bureaucrats um, in the day-to-day -day management, um, it doesn't, the difference between that and the, the Ming-Ching situation does not look as stark. Um, that being said, there's some really, uh, you know, in the sense that they were, they were not yet able to, nor were they inclined to collect as granular data as, um, as later happened. And that innovation really came out of the German states um, in the late 18th and the 19th century, and it becomes professionalized. And my understanding is that then Japanese foresters are um, in the Meiji period are influenced by both these sort of German models of forestry as well as the domestic models of forestry when they build um, this imperial forestry program. But that's something that didn't exist even in Prussia, you know, or Saxony in the 17th or, 18th, uh, or early 18th century. Um, and so some of it is, is a question of just um, how things changed with the development of the fiscal state um, over time. Um, that being said, I think that there are some really important institutional differences as well. And so my understanding of Japanese forestry in the Tokugawa period is that it's largely domain forestry. So each of the different domains in Japan with you know the Tokugawa being the, the biggest, you know, controlling a large, what is it, about a third or something like that of, of the archipelago and the rest of it 
being controlled by these other domainal lords. And some of them did very, um, you know, focused very intensively on forestry because it was a major source of, of revenue or, or what have you and others less so. And that's, I think in some ways more comparable to the situation in Europe where you have a bunch of competing sort of medium sized or small sized states that did very different things with their forestry programs. Um, in China, that you know, you do have this very large imperial state um, that is um, not competing with these different regional programs, and so there's less room for this type of, of you know innovation. Um, and there's also, as you point out, this this sort of political philosophy of of having administration um, interfere less um, into local matters. So I think it's a multi, you know, um, multiple uh, forms of difference. Mm -hmm. And there are still many excellent questions left unanswered. My apology. It, it just these, these two speakers, so they really inspired all of us into thinking. So if you are interested, please follow up with our speakers. Before we thank our speakers, let me quickly mention two things. First, do not forget about our next event on Friday, November 6th dinner time, East Coast dinner time, seven o'clock, a uh, talk by Judith Shapiro and Yifei Li on authoritarian environmentalism and the Chinese in ecological civilization, 7 p.m. November 6th. And also second, our speakers have mentioned several other scholars working on East Asian environmental history. I want to call out two names who are in our list, Zhang Li and also Meng Zhang. But Zhang is working on a fascinating environmental history for Chosang Korea. And I, my understanding is Zhang Meng um, at a University of Loyota is finishing her book, which is related to forest too. So um, check out, follow them. But please do not forget to check out the new books written by our authors, speakers here, Seeds of Control, Japan's Empire of Forestry in Colonial Korea, and Fur, of, uh, Fur and Empire, the Transformation of Forests in Early Modern China by David Feynman and Ian Miller. Both books are published this year, fresh off you know, the press from University of Washington Post. Everybody, thank you so much for attending today's event. Uh, the times are short, I wish we could continue, but please come back. We can continue carrying the conversation into the next event. So thank you so much. And thank you, John, uh, Ian and David for your fascinating talk. If both of you don't mind, please stay on this for another minute after everybody log out so we can wind down for a minute together. Thank you. Thanks, Ling. <laughs>